Your Excellencies, Commander of the Army, Lieutenant General Krishanthi de Silva, Chiefs of the Tri Forces, military officials, international delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure, indeed it's a privilege, to have been invited once again to deliver the concluding address. I think the uh, past two days have provided us with a really nuanced understanding of the complexity and breadth of contemporary debates on national security and emerging global threats. And it's been, and I'm sure you'll all agree, an extremely informative uh, and uh, excellent uh, uh, defense seminar. I think it's an enormous tribute to the Sri Lankan army for having conceptualized and hosted this conference. And I might add, hosted it so well, so many of the international delegates have told me how well they've been looked after here in Sri Lanka and what a wonderful welcome they've had. So thank you to all those who assisted in making this successful. And I think it's an, really an eminently suitable platform uh, to bring together academicians, researchers, and also civilian and military officials to be able to have really a wonderful dialogue and discourse and share our ideas and learn from them. To me, I think the conference has reminded us that since the end of the Cold War era, we've seen a gradual disappearance of the bipolar world and the evolution of a new world order. And the imperative, I think, is to reorientate ourselves from the traditional security paradigm and to understand the transformation that's taken place in the last few years of the concept of security. The traditional not notion of security in the Westphalian model has been superseded by a much more comprehensive and holistic view, incorporating not just political and military security, but also energy, environment, eco-security, health, socio-economic, and cybersecurity. So it's clear to me that I think all these dimensions need to be subsumed under the rubric of a comprehensive and holistic, holistic international security. Now globalization has been partly responsible for the new world order and it certainly exacerbates the challenges of national security. But globalization also brings with it tremendous opportunities. Opportunities actually for learning and to share ideas and I think that's exemplified by the presence of so many international delegates here today. We've had them, I think, over 50 delegates from over 35 countries. So we must thank you all for taking the trouble to come to Sri Lanka for this conference and to share your ideas. And I must also take the opportunity to thank all the wonderful, tremendously erudite and intellectual international experts who have contributed so much uh, to this conference uh, over the last two days. Now, the conference itself, I think, was initially the welcome address was delivered by the commander of the army. And uh, the secretary of defense, Mr. Basnaika, then gave an overall view of the concept and reasoning and rationale behind the defense seminar. The tone of the seminar was certainly set by His Excellency Hamid Karzai, the previous uh, president of Afghanistan. He traced the history and challenges faced by his country over the years, and the struggle for independence, but also how his country became a conflict ground for political ideologies and radicalism, with the subsequent emergence of a multiplicity of non-state actors using religion and ethnicity as instruments and tools of control to satisfy the aspirations of external states. And His Excellency Karzai very clearly highlighted the perils of a very, very narrow definition of security and a narrow definition of national interest. And he offered two alternatives. One, the return of morality to political ideology. Or two, a balance of power. So effectively, morality or alternatively, bipolarity. Because he advocated that to replace the very ubiquitous pursuit 
of very narrow parochial national interests of one state over the interests of the other. If we go on to the first session, which was the nature of threats affecting the security of the nation, um, Dr. Arvind Gupta articulated the role of emerging powers, most of whom are in Asia, and the need to strengthen multilateral and regional institutions to make them more representative, particularly the new emerging Asian powers. He spoke about the need for a blue economy with regard to maritime security. He spoke about the need to try and avoid radicalization of youth, the lack of a uniform international counterterrorism strategy. And he spoke about the fragile international economy, particularly with reference to China and the recent meltdown in China. He also articulated India's thrust of neighborhood diplomacy, increased engagement with superpowers, and revitalization of maritime cooperation. Christopher Coker gave us quite an interesting comparison between the 1930s and 2008 in terms of the Great Recession, revisionist powers, a clash of civilizations, and a weakened international system, but also highlighted the need for social inequality and climate change. Dr. Matteo Legrenzi gave a very informative and pretty perspicacious analysis of the Middle East axis and what he called the proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran within the sectarian analytical framework. And he also spoke about the ramifications of the recent nuclear deal and also the effect of uh, the lifting of Iranian sanctions. He also used the examples of Bahrain, of Lebanon, of Yemen, of Iraq and Syria to highlight the detrimental impact of non-state actors on national security. Subsequent to that, Dr. Lawrence Prabhakar spoke about the nature and magnitude of transnational challenges, hybrid warfare and asymmetric economic vulnerabilities, in particular against the weaker states of South Asia. He also emphasized the Im imperative of human development as the derivative of good governance yielding a comprehensive security founded on humane social equity. We went on to section two, which was about the emerging world order. And what was clear was that it was actually very difficult to define, uh, to have a constant definition of what the new world order was. But what was certainly clear that there was an evolution. We've moved towards a multipolar, polycentric world and that has partly been uh, uh, affected by the demographic shifts, the shifts in economic power towards Asia, the ICT revolution, and globalization. We had several country perspectives. First, we had His Excellency, the, uh, the High Commissioner of Pakistan, Major General Saeed Shahil Hussain, and he articulated how much Pakistan was misunderstood, particularly in the last few years. He also emphasized that his country was deeply committed to fighting terrorism. He also emphasized the devastating consequences of climate change and how it was faced by Pakistan and the need for an integrated eco-security strategy. Subsequent to that, Lady Olga Maitland, in her extremely penetrating and incisive lecture, offered again a very perspicacious analysis of geopolitics and geoeconomics from a UK perspective. She highlighted the need for greater dialogue with Russia, the downside of sanctions, the need for a stronger NATO, and for a unified global effort to fight terrorism. Lady Olga Maitland also articulated the impact of the oil price crash on the economic security of traditional oil producers. And she also spoke about the imperative of good governance, of socioeconomic security, of education, and of the imperative of providing hope and aspiration to the youth to avoid this radicalization that sometimes leads to terrorism. Because after all, it's at a young age that the mind is most open to inquiry and debate. It's at a young age that we can actually challenge conventional wisdom. Dr. Uttam Singha then gave an Indian perspective. His view was that the world order was almost an argument, an argument about balance of power, and the imperative, therefore, 
is how this balance can be managed, which was really very much the theme of His Excellency Hamid Karzai. The evolving international order today is more Asia-centric and polycentric, and what he articulated was that with the strong leadership of Narendra Modi, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, that India intends to be a strategic influencer in the transformative world order, working within a multipolar, rules-based, multilateral system, and being a force for stability, peace, and security in the region. He actually conceptualized South Asia as, as a riverine neighborhood, concentrating, with India concentrating on neighborhood diplomacy, on revitalization of its maritime diplomacy, of engagement with superpowers, counterterrorism, and regional cooperation. And I had the privilege of meeting Prime Minister Narendra Modi many years ago when he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. And in the little discussion that we had, we had a roundtable discussion when I was representing the Commonwealth Business Council, it was very clear to me, his razor-sharp focus, it was very clear to me that one day he would be the leader of one of the next great superpowers. Professor Rashid Uzaf Aman spoke about the cartographic conundrum and provided a perspective on trends and drivers of security in the West Asian concept. In his opinion, the main security challenges were failing states and aspiring non-state actors. And his idea of imperatives for stability, for state stability, were firstly law and order, secondly, territorial control, and thirdly, a population ideologically bound together. We also had uh, an excellent lecture by His Excellency the Chinese Ambassador, who articulated Chinese, uh, China's commitment to peace and economic development and to a common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security. He also strongly highlighted the link between poverty, insecurity, and conflict and reiterated the global imperative to address poverty and social equity as a prerequisite. He also provided an overview of China's collaborative partnerships and policies to provide both regional and international stability, its involvement with international peacekeeping missions, and peaceful resolution of maritime disputes, and its humanitarian missions. He also articulated the need for greater engagement of politicians with the services and the fundamental prerequisites of peace, security, and justice. When we came on to the third section, which was about terrorism, terrorism thrives on political instability. Asymmetric conflicts can leave nations vulnerable and exposed and subvert their governments. Major General Pereira provided a very comprehensive analysis of the conceptual models of terrorism, and he provided a lucid explanation of multiple frameworks and models ranging from Rodney Stark to De La Porta to Marx and Vervoca, and the distinction between insurgency and terrorism. And I think it serves to remind us that presentation of an important point of the difficulties in classification today of who and what a terrorist actually is, and that a terrorist of today is fundamentally different from the insurgent of 20 years ago, and that there's been an evolution of the nature, the drivers, the funders, the ideology, and the framework within which terrorists operate today. Mr. Yasan Thakoda gave us a view of the ICT revolution and the impact of it. It enables seamless crossing across borders, and it's distorted the distinction between internal and external security. And I think ICT has actually deepened the concept of globalization. But the internet and social media actually democratizes countries, it democratizes industries and individuals. And look at the effect of social media on the Arab Spring. It empowers ordinary citizens. The key is how fast we can actually absorb the ICT and a knowledge-driven economy. The key is how fast we can harness big data, the mobile internet, and what is termed today disruptive technology which makes a fundamental difference to the models by which we work. But the problem is the very power that the internet brings also has greatly expanded the opportunities for transnational crime. And secondly, the dependence 
our global dependence on ICT infrastructure leaves states extremely vulnerable to cyber attacks. Dr. Ajay Sani spoke about how the nature of terrorism has evolved within the context of readjustment of the world order and breakdown of the old equations of power, and hence the difficulty that we may have, which I alluded to earlier, of a consensual definition of terrorism. He made the very important point that almost all terrorist movements have some backing from another external state or external funder. And he also made the point that very often non-state actors eventually turn against the sponsoring state. And this dynamic nature of terrorism, I feel, with its many protean manifestations, is constantly opening up new theaters of conflict which is often met with bewilderment, according to Dr. Sani, bewilderment and surprise, and an inadequate state response with strategic errors of judgment and inadequate state capacity and capability. And he highlighted the need for a cohesive and unified strategy with capacity and will to implement. We then went on to the final session, which was non-military threats to national security. This morning, Ms. Viviana de Anuntis spoke about the high frequency of natural disasters in the Asia-Pacific region and the challenges therein. She spoke about the post-2015 development agenda and the World Humanitarian Sub Summit, which is due to be held in Istanbul in 2016, and the development of a coherent framework unifying all these together, and guidelines for disaster management. Air Vice Marshal Das spoke about the aviation domain infrastructure as a ready target for terrorism and the aim of achieving a balance between, on the one hand, ensuring a free flow of people and commerce, and on the other hand, preventing terrorists from exploiting the air domain. Rear Admiral Watheva spoke about threats to maritime security, including piracy. He spoke about the 70-80-90 statistic and highlighted the importance of the Indian Ocean region and the choke points that exist, in particular because two-thirds of the world's energy and over 50% of the world's trade traverses the Indian Ocean region, which is surrounded by over 30 littoral states. He also spoke about the tragedy of the commons, that when states behave to maximize their national interests to the detriment of the, com uh, to the, detriment of the common good. The other point is that when states engage in competing territorial claims, piracy finds its most fertile operating ground. So what is clear, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, is that the world order is constantly evolving and we've moved towards a multipolar, polycentric world. What is clear is we also need to broaden our concept and definition of national security. And if we are to have global security, we need to earn global respect. International security is the arena where most leaders, heads of state, have the opportunity for statesmanship. During my 25 or so years during which I was involved, when I was a doctor in London, or from the time I was a student to being a doctor, I was also, because I was interested in international development, uh, very much involved with Commonwealth societies. So over 25 years, uh, a particular society I belong to, the Royal Commonwealth Society, uh, gave a platform for visiting heads of state from the Commonwealth. And we hosted over 40 presidents and prime ministers during that time, both Democrats and autocrats, because we did not want to be judgmental. We wanted to give everyone the opportunity to have a platform and an independent platform. But during that time, I often wondered, what is the difference between a leader, a political leader, and a real statesman? And that is the imperative if we are to achieve anything in global security. And there were three, three leaders who I really thought achieved statesmanship. The first, of, of, those are of the people I have met. I'm sure there are many other leaders outside, but I'm talking only about the 40 or so heads of state that we encountered. The first 
was Nelson Mandela. We were part of his uh, involvement in his campaign uh, to free Nelson Mandela. And when he was freed, after 27 years in captivity, in prison, many people said and uh, applauded him for ending apartheid. But I think he was a statesman for far greater reasons. It's because after 27 years in prison, he forgave his captors. And I think that's a remarkable achievement. And he was the personification of equanimity. And after that, he went on to leave South Africa, and then he retired and was enormously respected after retirement as the elder statesman. The second, who I think achieved that statesman-like uh, level, was Lee Kuan Yew. Now, Lee Kuan Yew, some people thought, was an autocrat. He had tremendous intellectual discipline, tremendous academic discipline. I think he got a double first at Cambridge. But he took his country singularly from first world to third world, uh, from third world to first world, sorry. Lee Kuan Yew took his country from third world to first world in a single generation. And he did it because he ensured a clean government, a meritocratic government, an efficient government, and a self-sufficient government and civil service. And that is why I admire Lee Kuan Yew. And the third person I have chosen is Dr. Mahathir Mohammed, who's a doctor of medicine. Dr. Mahathir Mohammed took his country from some, a per capita income, something like four five hundred dollars a year, to over nine thousand dollars at the end of his tenure. But the mark of the man was that he was not wedded to any particular political ideology. He had that deep security in himself to be flexible and have that flexibility of thought. When he was asked, and I remember chairing a session with him, and when he was asked, Dr. Mahatya, are you a capitalist or a socialist? He said, I'm not a capitalist or socialist, I'm a pragmatist. I take what is best from capitalism, which is appropriate, appropriate for my country and my people at that stage in their development, and I reject the rest. I take what is best from socialism, which is best for my country and my people at that stage in their development, and reject the rest. But you know what the real mark of the man is? He then went on to say, and at a later stage, as my people and country progresses, if there's something I've left behind, I'll take that too. So what do we see in these three leaders? Yes, they were all tremendously educated in the broader sense of the word. But also, they were able, they had the deep security, deep inner sense of security, to be able to transcend their ego and to be able to put their country and their people before their own ideology and before themselves. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we need in leaders today. And those are three statesmen I tremendously admire. Because I think if we had more statesmen like that, this whole issue of security would actually dissolve. Now, international security is a final thought. Also, is quite an evocative concept. It entails justice, morality, and responsibility. And, but whether we talk about political, military security, eco-security, cyber security, national security, whatever we talk about, it is all derived from the security of individuals, you and I. It is us who need to feel secure, even though it's a very evocative concept. And that depends on the strength or frailty of human beings. And I feel, and this as a doctor of medicine, if we really examine ourselves at an individual level, and how we relate with each other, or with one country to another, if we treat each other with respect and dignity, irrespective of race or religion, if we ensure that the strong do not oppress the weak, if we respect each other's human rights, values, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, without imposing our own values and our own ideology, 
And if we ensure socio-economic justice, then we'll have little to fear, ladies and gentlemen, because then we will derive and gain all the security that we yearn and crave for. Because, ladies and gentlemen, war is made in the minds of men and women. And so too, peace is made in the minds of men and women. I thank you.